when Paul completed his first missionary journey, a journey that took him through the cities of Galatia, cities like Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, preaching the gospel and planting churches, he and Barnabas then retraced their steps through each of those cities, according to Acts 14.22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. A few years later, while on his second missionary journey, which took him to the cities of Greece and Macedonia, cities like Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, once again preaching the gospel and planting churches, Paul grew concerned about the Thessalonian saints, fearing perhaps that affliction might cause them to fall away from Christ. So we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul writes to them and he says, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these, by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But Timothy returned to Paul with good news. The Thessalonian church was standing firm in their faith. What are we to learn from these two accounts, Acts 14, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3? Well, I think at least three truths emerge. First, the path to glory leads through the valley of suffering. What did Paul tell the Galatian churches? Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And the Thessalonian saints... Let no one be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. And we could multiply such statements from Scripture. Paul told the Roman church that they were heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided if we suffer with Him, in order that we may be glorified with Him. Tribulation, affliction, suffering, this is the ordained path to eternal life and glory for every one of God's saints. There is no other way to heaven. God will test and refine your faith along your path to glory, and there is no other means of doing so than through tribulation and suffering. Indeed, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. In this world, you will have tribulation. For Jesus said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. The second truth that emerges is that only those who persevere in faith through tribulation will inherit the everlasting kingdom. It is by continuing in faith through the many tribulations that the Galatian saints must enter the kingdom of God. And if the Thessalonian saints failed to remain steadfast in their faith through tribulation and affliction, Paul says our labor would have been in vain. It is after promising persecution and the hatred of the world that Jesus declared in Matthew 10, 22, but it is the one who endures to the end who will be saved. And again, it is after predicting tribulation and persecution, the hatred of the nations and the apostasy of many in the visible church that Jesus said, but it is the one who perseveres to the end who will be saved, Matthew 24, 13. Now, we'll talk a little bit later about which is the root and which is the fruit. What is the cause and what is the effect of perseverance? For now, I just want to press home that the Bible makes everywhere abundantly clear you will experience tribulation and affliction that will test your faith. And if you fail to remain faithful and hopeful in Christ, you will not be saved on the last day. 
Number three, perseverance in faith requires faithful pastoral exhortation. The saints need to be prepared to suffer. They need to be told in advance about the necessity and the inevitability of tribulation. They need to be told in advance about the necessity of perseverance. And then they need to be personally equipped and encouraged and exhorted to persevere through on-the-ground, face-to-face shepherding. This is why Paul and Barnabas retraced their steps through those church that they had, churches that they had previously planted, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and instructing them, telling them that it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. And this is why then, in the very next verse, it says they appointed elders for them in every church. Because sheep need to be shepherded through tribulation and affliction. This is why Paul quickly sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one would be moved by these afflictions. Sheep need shepherds, especially when they are suffering. Perseverance requires personal pastoral care. This is why I doubt the sincerity of any professing Christian who's not vitally connected to a healthy local church. Perseverance is a corporate responsibility. Indeed, it's a corporate ministry. It requires the whole church to continue steadfast in the faith through many tribulations and so enter the kingdom of God. Now, you may wonder where I'm going with all of this. I've been preaching for 10 minutes and I've yet to touch the book of Daniel. Number one, that's not uncommon. But number two, (laughs) here's the connection. I contend that Paul did not need special apostolic revelation to know that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God or that saints have been destined for affliction. He could have simply read the book of Daniel. One could make a strong case that the perseverance of the saints through tribulation is the main theme of the book of Daniel. Think about it. The first six chapters are essentially the story of the perseverance of Daniel and his three friends through the tribulation that was the Babylonian exile. In chapter 1, Daniel and his friends resisted the Babylonian re-education program and they maintained their distinctive exilic identities despite the threat of certain death. In chapter 2, Daniel learned that Babylon would not be the last great kingdom to persecute the saints. Rather, Babylon would be followed by other kings and kingdoms before the the final kingdom of God was fully and finally established. In chapter 3, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah refused to worship the image of the beast of Babylon, and they were thrown into the blazing, fiery furnace. In chapter 4, faithfulness required that Daniel inform Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on the face of the earth, who held Daniel's life in the palm of his hands, as it were. It was Daniel's duty, if he were to be faithful to God as a prophet of God, to tell Nebuchadnezzar that God would humble him to the dust, unless or until he recognized and submitted to God's sovereignty. In chapter 5, faithfulness required that Daniel rebuke Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, and inform him of his imminent demise. And in chapter 6, faithfulness required that Daniel worship God not only when it was convenient and safe, but also when it was forbidden and attended with the sentence of death. Daniel persevered, and he was cast into the lion's den. The visions of the last six chapters... Likewise, present a consistent message. Tribulation awaits the saints until the end of the age, when at last their deliverance and their inheritance finally comes. In chapter 7, Daniel learns that there will be a succession of beasts and beastly kingdoms culminating in an exceedingly wicked ruler who will make war upon the saints and prevail over them until the Ancient of Days passes judgment on behalf of the saints and they finally inherit the kingdom. In chapter 8, Daniel learns that Israel's more immediate future will see the kingdom pass from Babylon to Persia and from Persia to Greece until eventually a wicked ruler by the name of Antiochus IV arises to perpetuate unspeakable evils against the people of God. In chapter 9, Daniel learns that though Israel will soon return from exile and the city and the sanctuary will be rebuilt, the promised new covenant is not going to come, not for 70 weeks 
during which time there will be tribulations and abominations. And the vision of chapters 10 through 12 reveals much the same. The saints face a long future of tribulation culminating in the climactic wickedness of the Antichrist before deliverance in the promised kingdom finally arrives. These final chapters not only depict the tribulation that awaits the saints before the end, but they also demonstrate the necessity of perseverance because it's only the wise, that is those who persevere in the obedience of faith through the tribulation and affliction of this age, who will be raised to everlasting life and glory to shine like the stars forever and ever. The perseverance of the saints is the theme of Daniel, particularly of its last three chapters. So this morning we're going to examine these chapters and find those same three points that Paul pressed home to the churches of Galatia and to the church of Thessalonica. Number one, tribulation is necessary. Number two, perseverance is essential. And number three, wisdom is required. Then we will close by looking at the sovereign grace that enables and ensures our perseverance. Lest I send you away this morning thinking that our salvation on the day of resurrection is ultimately dependent upon our own determination and self-effort. It's not. In our perseverance as in everything else, God remains sovereign and free. So the first truth that we need to unpack this morning is that tribulation is necessary to our everlasting salvation. Or, as Paul told the Galatian churches, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Or, as he told the Thessalonian church, we are destined for affliction. From these last two chapters of Daniel, I want to ask the question, is that true? Followed by the question, and if so, why? Now, before we answer those questions, let's take a step back and consider the context of Daniel 10 through 12. The vision of Daniel 10 through 12, all one vision, was given in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, or about the year 536 B.C. Two years prior, Cyrus had issued his decree that the exiles should return from Jerusalem and there rebuild the temple. One year prior... The first wave of exiles returned from Babylon to Israel, and the construction of the temple began, and the regular offerings were reinstated. Soon, however, opposition arose from the Gentiles who had been transplanted by the Assyrians two centuries prior, and this opposition was so fierce that they brought an end to the rebuilding of the temple for 20 years. You can read about all these things in the first four chapters of Ezra. It would appear then that news of this opposition that Israel was facing in Jerusalem found its way back to Babylon, back to Daniel, and it was this crisis that called forth Daniel's prayer with fasting and mourning. So in response to Daniel's prayer, God dispatched an angelic messenger who appeared to Daniel, although this messenger was held up by the prince of Persia for three weeks, we saw in Daniel 10.13. Daniel 10, in fact, has a lot to teach us about the reality of spiritual warfare, as we saw a couple of weeks ago. At any rate, the message this glorious angelic being was sent to deliver to Daniel is the content of Daniel 11, verse 2, through Daniel 12, verse 3. This vision revealed that though Israel had returned to the promised land, their return did not mark the coming of the glorious kingdom of Zion the everlasting kingdom of God. Rather, the vision revealed that the people of God would face a long succession of kings and kingdoms, of wars and rumors of wars, as nation rose up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Sometimes the saints would be indirectly affected by this tribulation. They would just simply be caught uh, in the way between in the middle as two beasts fought it out for dominance. But sometimes one of the beasts would turn its attention toward the Holy Covenant, verse 30. And the saints would become the special object of his demonically inspired hatred, as it was in the case of Antiochus in the 2nd century B.C., when, after being repelled by the Romans in Egypt, he returned to vent his anger upon Israel and upon Israel's God. Look with me at verse 29 of chapter 11. At the time appointed... He shall return and come into the south, but it shall not be this time as it was before. 
For ships of Katim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the holy covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the holy covenant. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and the fortress, and shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate." As we saw last week, Antiochus declared war on the sacrament. He forbid circumcision upon pain of death. He declared war upon the Scriptures. He made the possession of a Torah scroll punishable by death. He, made, he declared war upon the Sabbath. He made observance of the Sabbath a penalty or a, a crime punishable by death. He declared war on the sacrifice. He put an end to the regular sacrifices and offerings. Instead, he sacrificed a pig upon the great altar. And finally, declared war war against the sanctuary. He erected a shrine to Zeus within the Holy of Holies. Sacrament, Scripture, Sabbath, sacrifice, sanctuary. He declared war against it all. This was a time of great tribulation for the saints of God, and it stands as a type, a microcosm of the tribulation that the saints would face throughout history, whether it be at the hands of the Roman authorities or at the hands of the Catholic Inquisition or the communists of China or the Taliban of Afghanistan or any other beastly regime that arises to try to stamp out the true worship of God. But the reign of terror of Antiochus IV Epiphanes between 168 and 164 B.C. especially stands as a type, as we have seen both in Daniel 7 and 8 and again in Daniel 11 and 12, as a type of the reign of terror of one greater than Antiochus, namely the Antichrist, the man of sin, the beast from the sea who will arise at the end of the age to make war upon the saints. This was demonstrated last week in chapter 11 by the way that the vision seamlessly transitions from the reign of Antiochus in verses 21 to 35 to the reign of the Antichrist in verses 36 down to the end, verse 45. In other words, Daniel chapter 11 tells us that the history of the covenant people is a long history of tribulation, or as Jesus says, it's like birth pangs. Such tribulation will increase in frequency and in intensity until the end approaches. Which brings us to Daniel 12.1. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So is it true that tribulation is necessary for the people of God? Is it true that we are destined for affliction? Well, the long history described in these chapters would seem to indicate that it is. The present age is not an age of peace. It's an age of birth pangs. But let's keep reading, and we'll see an even more explicit affirmation of this truth. Verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked... And behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, that's the angelic messenger from Daniel 10.5, who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, and he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time times and half a time, and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. Note that the end of the age hinges upon the shattering of the holy people. The end will not come until the saints have been shattered. 
This is so certain that it is confirmed with a two-handed oath sworn by the angelic messenger who calls upon the eternal God as witness to his words. We saw a similar prediction back in Daniel chapter 7. For instance, verse 21. As I looked, the little horn, which I said was uh, representative of the Antichrist at the end of the age, the little horn made war with the saints and prevailed upon them. And verse 25, he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So yes, tribulation is a certainty. Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, John 16, 33. And as God is neither inefficient nor capricious, if tribulation is a certainty, it must also be a necessity. The saints must be shattered before the end can come. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Why? Why this must? Why is it a necessity? Why would God ordain that his saints be shattered? Well, this text provides us with two answers. Number one, God ordains the shattering of his saints in order that they would be sanctified. Look at verse 8. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel. For the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. God shatters his saints in order that they would be sanctified, purified, and made white, refined. He breaks them down in order that they might be rebuilt into his image. Don't despise tribulation. Don't shrink back from affliction because nothing sanctifies like suffering. Our lives are filled with competing objects of faith and competing sources of joy. Especially here in middle class, middle America, we are inundated with competitors for the object of your faith and joy. Our souls are like a ship in dry dock, propped up by all manner of supports, and it takes a flood of tribulation to come in and sweep away those supports such that our souls are forced to float upon the sea of God's grace. We we naturally tend to lean upon our merit. We rest in our abilities. We hope in our possessions. We find security in our stuff. And each of these are hindrances to our everlasting joy and life. So God sends tribulations upon us in order to sweep away these false supports. For instance, He lets us fall into sin in order that we might not trust in our own righteousness and merit. He takes away our gifts and our abilities, or He lets us fail miserably in the employment of those gifts and abilities in order that we might not boast in our own strength. He causes famine and poverty to befall us in order that we might seek our joy in our possessions. Sometimes this tribulation takes the form of persecuting beasts who say, like Antiochus, Cease the sacrament, stop the sacrifices, defile the Sabbath, throw down your scriptures, or forfeit your life. That's precisely what he told the people of God in the second century BC. In other words, we might carry this into the present cease to follow Christ and worship God in any recognizable way, or lose everything, which is what the beasts of our age tell the saints in our day. Other times this tribulation takes the form of an illness that deprives us of gifts, abilities, even life. Or it takes the form of temptation into which we fall in order that we would no longer trust in our righteousness but hope in Christ's righteousness alone. There's no better way to deal with the problem of self-righteousness than to let you fall into a sin that you never dreamt you were capable of. 
Whatever form it takes, God employs a tribulation to shatter His saints in order that they might be sanctified, purified, made white, refined, because nothing sanctifies like suffering. But second, God shatters His saints in order that they might be separated from the apostates, the true from the false, the real from the counterfeit, the fruitful from the fraudulent. Look again at verse 10. Look at the effect of this tribulation. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. One commentator wrote this. He said, There's nothing intrinsically purifying about fiery trials in themselves, and we should not seek them for their own sake. Don't go running after tribulation. You don't have to. It'll find you. The refiner's fire, he says, does not create the pure metal. It simply reveals it. If you put metallic ore into the crucible, the pure metal will sink to the bottom and you can remove the slag from the top. However, if what you put into the crucible is dross to begin with, you'll get out nothing but dross. The fire simply reveals the true nature of the material being refined. Listen, tribulation does not create saints. It separates them from apostates. Suffering does not create sheep. It separates them from the goats. This is another purpose in God's shattering of the power of the saints. Tribulation reveals the presence or the absence of true faith. Look back at verse 32 of Daniel chapter 11 and the effect the tribulation under Antiochus had upon the nation of Israel. The church of that day, if you will. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. So some of them are seduced with flattery. Do what I say and I'll let you keep your life and your possessions. In fact, I'll, I'll bestow more honor and wealth upon you. Disobey me, remain faithful to your God, and I'll put you to death. What, what, what's the end of, of those two tracks? Well, you don't have to guess. It's spelled out for you in Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. What happens to those who are seduced by flattery in the days of tribulation? They will be raised to shame and everlasting contempt. But what about those who know their God and stand firm and take action? They will be raised to everlasting life. They will shine like the brightness of the sky above, like the stars forever and ever. In the day of tribulation, there's only two groups. There are the seduced and there are those who stand firm. There are the wicked and there are the wise. And on the day of resurrection, there are those who will be ashamed And there will those who will shine like the stars forever and ever. And the point of these chapters is that those two groups are one and the same. Those who fail on the day of tribulation, they'll be raised to contempt on the day of resurrection. Those who remain steadfast in the day of tribulation, they'll be raised to everlasting life on the day of resurrection. God shatters His saints in order to separate them from the apostates, the false brethren, the goats. And that separation does not merely await the last day. It is made evident in the here and now in the way that we respond to tribulation and affliction. Not only is tribulation necessary, perseverance is essential. This is the second truth which the Apostle Paul pressed home upon the churches of Galatia and Thessalonica, and it is a second truth that he could easily have gleaned from Daniel 11 and 12. It matters how we respond to tribulation. It matters eternally. Now, let me state this as plainly as possible. How you respond to tribulation reveals where you will spend eternity. Let me say that again. 
How you respond to tribulation reveals where you will spend eternity. Now notice what I did not say. I did not say how you respond to tribulation determines where you will spend eternity. We do not earn eternal life by our perseverance. Salvation remains a gift of free grace. Rather, how you respond to tribulation reveals whether that gift of free grace belongs to you or not. It reveals where you will spend eternity because tribulation reveals the presence or absence of true faith. That perseverance in faith is essential to our everlasting salvation is clear from those verses we just read in verses 2 and 3 of Daniel 12. Who will be raised to everlasting life on the last day to shine like the stars forever and ever? The wise. And who are the wise? According to verse 10 of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 35 of Daniel chapter 11, the wise are those who purify themselves and make themselves white and are refined by the tribulation. And who will be raised to shame and everlasting contempt? The wicked. And who are the wicked? In the context of Daniel 11 and 12, the wicked are not only the pagans who do not know God, more specifically, they're the false brethren who are seduced into violating the covenant through promises of life and prosperity. Now that we are reading Daniel correctly, that perseverance is indeed essential to our everlasting Resurrection unto eternal life is confirmed by a host of New Testament passages. I read several of them to you in the introduction. I want to add just one more here now to confirm what we're reading here in Daniel chapter 12, to confirm that we're on the right track. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, Paul tells the Colossian saints, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, in order to raise you to everlasting life and joy in the presence of your God and Savior. He will do that if, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. You will only be presented holy and blameless and above reproach before Christ if you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Yes, perseverance in faith is essential to our everlasting salvation. But let's define exactly what is meant by perseverance. Well, again, Daniel 11 and 12 help us out. Daniel 11.32, I think, helps us derive a definition of what God considers perseverance in faith. It says, He, that is Antiochus, the king of the north, shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. So here in verse 32, you have two groups that are set in opposing parallel to one another. Those who violate the covenant in the first half and those who remain faithful to the covenant in the second half. Those who remain faithful to the covenant are defined as those who know their God, who stand firm, and who take action. So I define perseverance as faithfulness to the covenant with God. In Daniel's day, that was the old covenant which God made with Israel at Sinai. And so, when Antiochus came into Jerusalem and forbade those actions that were necessary and essential to covenant faithfulness, like the sacrament, circumcision, the scriptures, the Torah, Sabbath observance, and the sacrifices... Under the old covenant, faithfulness demanded that the saints accept death rather than forsake those things in order to save their life, and many did. And this obedience was rooted in a true and living faith in the Lord. They were a people who knew their God. That's why they stood firm and took action. Now, we are no longer under the old covenant 
We are under the new covenant mediated in the blood of Christ. We are no longer bound by those ceremonial laws and rituals of the old covenant. But perseverance demands of us the very same thing, faithfulness to the new covenant. What is faithfulness to the new covenant? The obedience of faith. It is obedience to Christ rooted in a true faith born of sovereign grace. In other words, you're not persevering if you don't continue to hope in the gospel, but you don't really hope in the gospel if you don't persevere in obedience. Well, let's press into that definition a bit further. These chapters highlight two particular facets of perseverance and covenant faithfulness. Note what the text says the wise, right? Those who persevere, they're the wise. Those who fall away, they're the wicked. Know what the text says the wise do. First, they encourage others to the obedience of faith. Look at verse 33 of Daniel 11. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. And look down at chapter 12 and verse 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The wise make many understand. They turn many to righteousness. Evidently then, perseverance is not merely an individual matter. It's a corporate activity. It requires mutual exhortation. This is why the author of Hebrews writes to his persecuted congregation, a congregation enduring tribulation and affliction, and he not only exhorts them to perseverance, but he instructs them to exhort one another to perseverance. He says repeatedly things like this, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that no one may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that I'm not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? It's yours. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that you're not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? It's ours. We are our brother's keeper. Perseverance requires both pastoral and mutual exhortation. When tribulation sweeps over you like a flood, you need brothers and sisters and pastors there beside you, encouraging you to continue in the faith, pleading with you to not give up, to not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, and reminding you in those dark days that we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are of those who persevere in the faith and are saved. We are in this together. We all have a role to play in one another's perseverance. Second, those who persevere in covenant faithfulness are those who are refined, purified, and made white by tribulation. Verse 35 of chapter 11 and verse 10 of chapter 12. Rather than, for instance, becoming hardened, embittered, and joyless. Perseverance is not the joyless determination to just get grit your teeth and get through it. That's not what the people who know their God do. Listen again to the author of Hebrews. He's reminding the church, recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Note that, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. They came in because you were Christians. They took away your stuff which you had worked for, and you rejoiced in it. How? Because they knew their God. They believed that they had a better and an abiding possession in heaven. They joyfully persevered by faith in a reward they could not see. That is biblical perseverance. It's that faith that Peter and John displayed when they were harassed once again by the Jewish authorities in Acts chapter 5. And it says they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. 
Yes, but that's speaking about persecution. Surely we're not expected to be joyful when we're diagnosed with cancer or ALS or we lose our job or a, or a loved one tragically dies. Surely that's not the kind of tribulation you're speaking of. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James 1, 2-4. So here's the difference between perseverance and faith and just a mere dogged determinism. Perseverance endures tribulation with joy and faith, resulting in steadfastness and sanctification. Verse 10. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. If something terrible happened to you and it left you hardened and embittered, you haven't persevered. One truth remains to unpack from these chapters. We've seen that tribulation is necessary and that perseverance is essential. Finally, these chapters reveal that in order to persevere through the necessary tribulations, wisdom is required. Note the common thread, verse 33 of chapter 11. The wise among the people shall make many understand. And verse 10 of chapter 12. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. What shall the wise understand that enable them to persevere that the wicked don't understand and so they fall away? I think it's verse 4. I think it's the contents of the book. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Look down at verse 8. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he said, Go your way, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. In other words, he points them back to the book. What you have in the book is sufficient. Understand that. The book is a reference at least to the prophecy Daniel's been given in these last three chapters, maybe to all of the visions of Daniel. And that Daniel is to shut it up and seal the book does not mean that he's to keep it secret. If, if that was what was meant, then Daniel clearly failed because this book's been received Scripture by the people of God for 2,500 years. Rather, shut up means to close up the revelation and add nothing more to it, to write no more, to preserve it such that it remains unaltered from the, the way in which it was given. And to seal means to authenticate. So for Daniel to seal up the book, to put his seal upon it, meant that he authenticated it as the precise revelation that he received. The second half of verse 4 is difficult. It's provoked a number of different interpretations, but I find one convincing. I I think that verse 4, the second half, is an allusion to Amos 8.12, which actually speaks of the opposite. It says, They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. So the sense of Daniel 12.4 would then be that Daniel is to preserve and protect entire and complete the revelation he has received because in time to come, many are going to wander to and fro in various different religions and sects seeking for the knowledge of God, but they will not attain to the wisdom that leads to salvation. Why? Because they won't look in the book. They're going to search for wisdom anywhere and everywhere else, but they won't look in the book. Then when Daniel confesses he doesn't understand the time frame spoken by the angelic messenger in verse 8, and he says, "O, O Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He's essentially told, everything you need to know is written in the book. Go your way, Daniel, for the words are sealed up or shut up and sealed until the time of the end. So I take this to mean that the perseverance that is required of us demands wisdom and that wisdom is found in understanding this book. You want to persevere? Understand this book. 
Now, what wisdom specifically might be gleaned from this book that could enable us to persevere through tribulation such that we are raised to everlasting life? Well, we might, number, we might mention any number of different truths, some that we've, we've looked at in this, in this sermon, that tribulation is necessary, that perseverance is essential, that wisdom is required, right? But the one that Daniel 12 seems to have in mind is that if the wise are to persevere, they must understand the timing of tribulation. Verse 7, And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, And he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. Verse 10, many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. Time, times, and half a time is identical to the period given in Daniel 7 during which the little horn, who I think is the Antichrist, shall wear out the saints, Daniel 7.25. I think it's the same period signified by 1,290 days, which is roughly three and a half years. Three and a half units of time may also equate to half of a seven, half of a week in Daniel 9.27. So what do all these mean? Well, it shouldn't surprise anybody by now that I regard this time frame as symbolic rather than literal. I've not found a literal interpretation of this time frame that is satisfactory to me. So I take it to refer generally as it does in Daniel 7, Daniel 9, and here in Daniel 12, and also in Revelation 13 and 12, I take it to refer to a period of intense persecution of the saints, a time that is of limited duration, because it's half of seven, which is symbolic of completion, a complete week, this is only half the week, but a time that is precisely measured by God, which is why it's given in days as well as the generic time frame. It may not be coincidental that Antiochus' reign of terror in Jerusalem lasted about three and a half years, from 168 to 164 B.C., or that the Jewish rebellion leading to the destruction of Jerusalem lasted roughly the same length, from A.D. 66 to 70. It could be that the same time frame awaits the saints under the reign of Antichrist at the end of the age. That same time frame is employed in Revelation 12, 14 to describe the present age of tribulation. In any case, the time frame presents or represents a period of intense persecution, of limited duration, cut short, says Jesus, for the sake of the elect or else no one would be saved, Matthew 24, 21. Now, what about the 1,335 days? That's 45 days more than 1,290. I don't know which I think is kind of the point. Ian Doug, you would suggest, quote, the inclusion of this number seems designed to heighten the sense of mystery that surrounds the Lord's timing and the need for faithful and perseverance on the part of the saints, even when, according to human wisdom, God's arrival seems to be overdue. Though the time for God to complete His work may seem to have come, His people will still have to wait patiently for the end, end quote. In other words... The saints must persevere through the tribulation, even through its most intense manifestations. Indeed, they must persevere to the very end. They must persevere through the 1290 and then further to the 1335. If and only if they do, are they blessed. The wisdom that enables the saints to persevere is the knowledge that the tribulation we face will not endure forever. It is limited in its duration, it is cut short for the sake of the elect, and it is precisely numbered by God. The angel ends his words to Daniel with this final encouragement, verse 13, but go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. In other words, Daniel would not live to see any of the events that are foretold in this final vision. At the age of 85, he likely did not live to see the death of Cyrus, the very first king of the Persian Empire. Even so, his call is the same as the call to every saint, to us. 
persevere to the end, whatever your end is, then rest and be raised on the last day. This morning we've examined Daniel chapter 12. We've seen that tribulation is necessary, perseverance is essential, wisdom is required. And my hope is that you have either been convinced or confirmed in the truth that all of the saints must endure tribulation according to the will of God, that it is only those who persevere to the end in the obedience of faith who will be saved. I hope you've been convinced of that. It's biblical. As we conclude this sermon and this study of Daniel, I want to circle back around, though, to the other foundational truth that runs like an an undercurrent, like a thread tying all of these visions together, and that is the sovereignty of God. So look back at Daniel 12.1, and let's ask the question, who will be saved on the last day? At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge over your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. All right? Who is going to be delivered on the day of tribulation? Who is going to be raised to everlasting life to shine like the stars forever and ever? Answer, those who persevere to the end. But what is true of them long before they persevere to the end? Did you see it? Their names are written in the book. What book? The book of life. Before and beneath our perseverance in faith is our election of grace. Revelation 13, 8, And the beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone, that is, whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. This removes all grounds of boasting and keeps our perseverance entirely of grace. We persevere in faith not because we're strong enough, not because we're courageous enough, not because we're holy enough. We persevere because we were chosen. Our names have been written in the book from the foundation of the world. The Lamb was then slain for us, and His blood has purchased our perseverance. We can no more be lost or fail to persevere than Christ's blood can be spilled in vain or fail to be found sufficient. So if your reaction to this morning's sermon was, Oh, I hope I can make it, then you've missed the point. You can't, but Christ can, and He has, and His blood has purchased your perseverance, and His Spirit who indwells you ensures it, so you will persevere as long as you hope in Him. Avery and Isaac, look up here. I asked you this morning, I asked you. Do you this day commit by God's grace and help to follow Jesus in the obedience of faith as your Savior and King? And both of you said, I do. The two points of this message, and I don't want you to get the order wrong. Number one, you must, or else you will not be saved. And number two, you will, because of Christ's atoning blood shed for you and the Holy Spirit who dwells within you.